Shabbat Shalom. Today I will be speaking about sexual assault. If at any time it becomes too much, please do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. This past Monday morning, surrounded by women and allies from New York, Israel, and beyond, I stood outside the United Nations and called out the words, shame, shame, shame. The protest was aimed at the United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women, also known as UN Women for failing miserably to support Israeli women who had been viciously raped, tortured, and sexually assaulted by Hamas on October 7th, and for failing to condemn Hamas for these heinous crimes. Though the mission of UN Women is to protect the rights and safety of all women across the planet, in the face of the heinous atrocities committed against Israeli women on October 7th, UN women did, said, and offered nothing. That is, until word came out that a rally and a special session would be held to denounce their silence. Thus, it was only on December 1st, nearly two months after the start of the conflict, Two months after women's bodies were brutalized, mutilated, and tortured, and then in some cases paraded in the streets of Gaza, two months after these unspeakable scenes unfolded before all of our eyes, that UN women finally came out with a statement, half-hearted at best, condemning the actions of Hamas. And thus, those who protested outside the UN this past Monday had only this to say, too little, too late. The rally proceeded an emergency session inside the UN called Hear Our Voices, organized by the Permanent Mission of Israel to the UN in partnership with the World Zionist Organization, the National Council of Jewish Women, and others. This session was dedicated to lifting up the countless voices of the victims of gender-based violence on October 7th, voices that have been silenced by the UN's callous indifference to their suffering. Here Our Voices was deemed an emergency session because the silence around the rampant sexual violence of October 7th was only growing louder. And it was clear, if the world didn't start to pay attention, these victims and all victims of gender-based violence would pay an enormous price. Thus, in the absence of the UN calling for a session to discuss the war crimes committed against women on October 7th, Israel determined it must convene a UN session on their own to decry the disregard shown by the UN to Israel, to lambast the UN for its double standard when it comes to Israeli victims of rape, and to raise up the voices of the women who have been forcibly silenced, first by their rapists and murderers, and now by the UN in refusing to see the wounds, the anguish, and the very humanity of these Israeli victims. To be sure, the UN is not alone in dismissing and diminishing the suffering of Israeli women on October 7th. As First Lady of Israel, Michal Herzog wrote, the silence of international human rights organizations and the unwillingness to believe Israeli women in the face of overwhelming evidence has been devastating. The body known as the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, 
for example, put out a statement condemning, quote, escalating violence in the Middle East, in which they called upon all parties to systematically address the gender dimension of the conflict. But nowhere did they name Hamas, and nowhere did Sida address the unspeakable gender violence Hamas carried out on October 7th, despite their past advocacy for victims of sexual violence in the past. Israeli legal scholar and women's rights advocate, Professor Ruth Halperin Kadari, a former vice president of CEDA, said, CEDA is the most important women's rights international body that signals the direction in which women's rights should be developed. It sets standards for the whole world in terms of international women's rights, and yet, they have deliberately chosen to remain silent about Hamas's horrific crimes. Their unwillingness to advocate for and support Israeli victims is as astonishing as it is sickening. They join the likes of feminist organizations like Me Too, Women Deliver, and Equality Now, all of whom fell gravely short in their statements on the war all of whom failed to mention Hamas anywhere. The omissions here and from so many other organizations purporting to support all women speak volumes. Shockingly, some have not simply ignored the victims in Israel. They have actually denied their experiences altogether. Samantha Pearson, the now former director of the Sexual Assault Center at the University of Alberta, signed on to an open letter rejecting the fact that Hamas terrorists raped and tortured Israelis on October 7th. Pearson was fired for this shameful denial, but she is not alone. Israeli diplomat Sasan Hassan shares in the age of Me Too and Believe Women, far too many supposed supporters of justice, human rights, and feminism are engaging in rape denial. Some have chosen to justify or even mock and celebrate one of the most gruesome and publicized attacks on women in recent memory. And Meredith Jacobs, CEO of Jewish Women International, laments, here we are, the brutal rapes, bodily mutilations, and sadistic murder of women and children on October 7th are being dismissed as lies and Zionist propaganda. At Monday's emergency session, Mandana Dayani, an Iranian-born activist and advocate for female empowerment and human rights, spoke directly to the women's groups with whom she had worked over the years. What is it about these Israeli women and girls that makes them so unworthy of your otherwise limitless capacity for outrage, solidarity, and justice, challenged Dayani. Once again, I'm afraid the reason is quite simple, she said because they're Jews. If that's not the case, then now is the time to prove it. Gilad Erdan, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, expressed a similar sentiment, saying, sadly, the very international bodies that are supposedly the defenders of all women show that when it comes to Israelis, indifference is acceptable. To these organizations, Israeli women are not women. The rape of Israelis is not an act of rape. But neither denials nor indifference can erase the gruesome truth of what happened that day. With regards to the sexual violence that occurred on October 7th, there is little left to prove as the mountain of evidence, including eyewitness testimony videos, social media posts, and more, is only growing. 
the graphic and heart-rending testimony on Monday at the UN is but a fraction of the more than 1,000 testimonies collected by, the Isra by Israeli officials since October 7th. These brave souls spoke up at the UN in order that the world know this massacre of sexual violence is real and it cannot be ignored or denied any longer. Listen to their words. Simcha Greinemann, a volunteer with Zaka, the organization charged with collecting the remains and body parts of the dead so that they may be buried according to Jewish law, shared this painful testimony. I am standing in front of you today to tell the story of the horrific things that I saw with my own eyes and I dealt with my own hands on October 7th. I saw in front of my eyes a woman. She was naked. She had nails and different objects in her female organs. Her body was brutal in a way that we could not identify her. From her head to her toes, she was abused in a way we could not understand and we could not deal with. Sherry Mendez, an architect by training, but also a member of an Israeli reserve unit that prepares bodies of female soldiers for burial, saw much evidence of the violence firsthand. Many of the bodies, she explained, came to the base in bloody shredded rags or just in underwear, and their underwear was often very bloody. She continues, our team commander saw several female soldiers who were shot in their crotch intimate parts or shot in the breast. There seemed to be a systematic genital mutilation of a group of victims, she noted. Yael Reichert, chief superintendent of the Israeli National Police, read testimony from a survivor of the Nova Rave. Everything was an apocalypse of corpses. Girls without any clothes on, without tops, without underwear. There were girls with a broken pelvis due to repetitive rapes. Their legs were spread apart in a split. The evidence of what occurred on October 7th from testimony like this, from interrogations of captured Hamas terrorists, from videos that Hamas terrorists took themselves, is overwhelming and irrefutable. Hundreds of innocent souls were terrorized, brutalized, and murdered in cold blood on that day. The world has heard their screams. The world has seen their wounds and the world has borne witness to their torture. It's devastating that anyone would deny or pervert or justify these acts of barbarism. Rape is not an act of resistance. Rape should never be used as an instrument of war, and there is never a situation or context in which rape can be justified, never. Dear friends, in our Torah portion today, Vayeshev, Reuben, having second thoughts about his brother's plan to murder Joseph, says to them, let us not take his life. Those who were savagely raped, mutilated, tortured, or assaulted on October 7th lost their lives in the most horrific and unimaginable ways possible. But every time their experiences are dismissed or ignored or denied, they are degraded even more. It is a secondary humiliation. No one should ever have to endure alive or dead. And so let us pledge not to take any more of these victims' lives, not to take any more of their dignity or their value or worth, 
Let us instead restore what we can of their lives and their dignity and their worth by first believing them and believing the narrative of their broken bodies. Let us speak up on their behalf. Let us remind the world that these were real people, mothers and daughters and grandmothers and children and sisters and aunts and cousins and friends. Let us raise up their humanity let us take in their stories, their dreams, their hopes, and their fears. Let us honor their lives. These victims who died such unfathomably harsh and cruel deaths, whose last breaths were filled with suffering, and whose last sights were those of their inhumane executioners, they deserve our respect and so much more. Let us not take any more of their lives or their dignity. Too much has already been stolen from them. May we restore their lives in whatever way we can by speaking their truth on their behalf, by refusing to let their stories be erased, and by holding tight to all the wondrous and joyful and kind and beautiful traits that define them prior to this nightmare. May we guard their souls in empathy, compassion, and tenderness. And may we do everything humanly possible to keep their precious, innocent, and righteous memories alive through our words, through our actions, and through our love. Kenny Hiratson.